Yar, lads, have you got your grog and your saber, your cutlass by your side? Uh, today we are talking about pirates. Yar. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to do a Terra Nova Tuesday. Yes, I'm back. I'm actually trying to get this shit done. Uh, but today we're going to talk about Captain Peter Easton, one of the most notorious pirates, not just in Newfoundland, but in the whole of piracy. Uh, though, surprisingly, not a famous name. Uh, he was one of the most successful, and depending on who you ask, and I've got a variety of sources, uh, he was everything from the scourge of the Western Atlantic to a loyal English seaman who later turned pirate. And uh, as we go, we will, uh, we will examine some of those facets. Uh, I've got a lot of articles, so I will go through this somewhat quick. But uh, before I get to that, of course, the usual uh, requisite shilling. So do please subscribe to this channel. Uh, follow if you're watching on Rumble. Uh, if you want to support me, uh, also like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, if you want to support me, subscriptions on Rumble are actually paid. Uh, I believe the lowest tier is $5 a month. Uh, if you're interested in other uh, aspects of supporting me, you can actually support me through PayPal. You can use my email address. Yet again, I have to point out the PayPal, the PayPal.me link in my description is still not working. I am still waiting to hear back from PayPal as to why that is. Uh, but you can use ardentparty at gmail.com on PayPal to send me um, a donation if you want to offer me some support. Uh, I do have a subscribe star. That also is linked in the description. Uh, I have some great supporters who send me tips or subscribe to me as it is. Uh, I want to shout out a couple of them right now. That is, of course, Supreme Emperor Kizza and Simon JJ, as well as Stormy Eyes, who is a also my ex-stalker, now girlfriend. <laughs> That's the trick. Uh, but, to... Uh, uh, and, of course, the last piece of shilling that I have to do for myself personally today is my merch store, which, if you look uh, in the description, is a Redbubble store. Uh, at the moment, uh, in the hopefully somewhat near future, uh, Stormy and I will be uh, acquiring the equipment in order to make my own merch, uh, which should both be cheaper and hopefully allow me a significant uh, level of freedom when it comes to customization of some uh, graphics and things of that nature. I won't be beholden to someone else's opinion as to what's acceptable. Uh, but to move... Oh, sorry. One very last thing. Uh, please do check out Christopher Everard's channel. We will be doing a, I believe it's the third session of the Hunter the Reckoning role-playing game that Christopher is running. Uh, I don't know if the term Game Master or Narrator or what applies for White Wolf products. So, there's that. But, to return to our topic, uh, as you can see from the uh, thumbnail here, there are uh, significant sources for information on Peter Easton. Let me just get a sip of my grog to go in there. And uh, I've always had a... And I'll actually put myself back on screen. I, I'm i sure many of you enjoyed the, at the very least, the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Uh, I'm sure there were quite a few of us who enjoyed the old Crimson Pirate movie with, I believe it was Burt Lancaster. If I have that wrong and it turns out to be Tyrone Power, please do correct me. Um, if this is your first time watching one of my pieces of content, please do comment uh, in, in the comment section, whether Rumble or YouTube. Uh, I'm always interested to know any detail you care to share, where you're from, what, what interest you might have in pirates, things of that nature. Uh, of course... Pirates are fairly ubiquitous in uh, pop culture. They've been the subject of books, TV, movies, 
uh, video games. If you've ever played Assassin's Creed, I believe it's number four, Black Flag. Uh, I absolutely loved that game because I come from a sailing culture, uh, a seaborne culture at the very least, here in Newfoundland. And it's actually Newfoundland where Peter Easton garnered a significant amount of his fame as a pirate. And I'll just, uh, we'll move on to this article from the scuba news dot com from two thousand sixteen. I will point out one very glaring issue, as you can see with uh, Peter Easton's eye patch here, which this is actually more of a takeoff of Jack Sparrow. Uh, that eye patch is shaped like a maple leaf. That's intensely incorrect, as Peter Easton was active in the early sixteen hundreds, long before Canada was a thing. Not long after Newfoundland was a thing, though. Uh, in any case, we'll move along. So, of the various pirates who lurked along the wild, sparsely inhabited coasts of Newfoundland in the 16th and 17th centuries, Peter Easton was among the elite, most successful, and best known. His plundering, which ranged from Newfoundland and the Grand Banks, south to the Caribbean and Spanish Main, made him the scourge of the Western Atlantic for more than a decade. Easton was born of an old and respectable English family. Uh, I will point out as we go as well that there are sometimes interesting misunderstandings, misinterpretations, straight out errors uh, about Peter Easton. I have seen sources that claim he was Scots, uh, Scottish. So it's very difficult to be 100% certain. So... As, as we go, this will become clearer. Uh, let me see. So, Easton was born of an old and respectable English family, grew up to serve in Queen Elizabeth I's navy as a privateer. In 1602, on his way to Newfoundland, escorting an English fishing convoy, Easton captured a Dutch pirate ship and found she carried prisoners from an Irish ship sunk by the Dutchman. Among them was the daughter of the King of Connaught, a young lady named Sheila. And again, this is somewhat legendary information. Uh, the truth of this may be a little bit different, but uh, Princess Sheila, also known as Sheila Nagara, uh, supposedly married Easton's top lieutenant, Gilbert Pike, and on arriving in Newfoundland, the, set, the couple settled at Mosquito, now known as Bristol's Hope, on the western shore of Conception Bay. Uh, when Easton returned to England, he found that Queen Elizabeth had died and her successor, King James I, had disbanded the navy. So the privateer decided to become a pirate, preying on merchant ships plying the western approaches to the English Channel. His fleet was said to number 40 vessels by the time the king bowed to pressure from Easton's victims and sent a squadron under a young Captain Henry Mainwaring, who later also turned to piracy, to put a stop to the plundering. Tipped off to this, Easton took his ten best ships and crews and fled to Newfoundland, settling at Harbor Grace, just south of Mosquito, again, now known as Bristol's Hope. There he built a fort and settled down to some serious raiding. He demanded paid tributes from fishing vessels on the Grand Banks and built a flourishing trade in captured ships and goods. Among the fishing vessels and shore settlements, Easton found a ready source of capable, and often quite willing, crewmen for his fleet. Not only did the pirate fortify Harbor Grace, the late Newfoundland author Harold Horwood claims Easton also set up another base at Kelly's Island on the far shore of Conception Bay a place that itself bounds with lore of buried treasure and is said to even have been named after another pirate who was based there. Uh, the Spanish colonies of the Caribbean and their treasure galleons were Eastern Easton's favorite victims. He was sailing the San Sebastian, one of the richest prizes ever captured by a pirate, back to his Newfoundland quarters, headquarters sorry, in September 1611 when he was forced to deal with another of his adversaries. ships protecting the French and Basque fishing fleets, in Easton's absence, had raided and captured his fort at Harbor Grace. When they spotted the pirate's fleet entering Conception Bay, an intercepting, sorry, an intercepting squadron put out from the harbor, and the battle was on. With daring and skill, Easton's fleet defeated the Basque and wrecked their flagship St. Malo on a tiny islet outside the harbor. Then they landed and recaptured their fort. It is said that 47 of Easton's crew who died that day nearly 400 years ago are buried in a graveyard at Bear Cove near the mouth of Harbor Grace. Easton's prize, the San Sebastian, eventually was thoroughly looted of treasure, then burned and set adrift to ground further up the harbor where her bones may today still lie buried in the bottom. And just to give you a little bit of 
Uh, here we are. A little bit of interesting trivia. Uh, this is a church in the United... Uh, the, uh, this is a United Church. Um, I believe this is in Harbor Grace, though I may have that incorrect. Uh, when they were running a new sewer line some years back, they apparently discovered a uh, mass grave which, when examined, seemed to confirm the story of the 47 men who were killed in this uh, attack we were just talking about. And I'm just going to come back to the first article here. Uh, ships, da, 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 47 of his crew. Easton's prize was set, a, set ablaze and allowed to ground itself. With this sort of success, Peter Easton became a legend along the shores of Newfoundland. The first official English colony on the island, at Cupid's, a few miles south of Eastern Easton's lair, came to depend on the pirate for protection from raiding Basques and others. But Easton, perhaps still loyal to the crown, began making overtures to King James for a pardon. Having captured the, quote, Admiral of the English fishing fleet, Captain Richard Whitburn, and kept him prisoner for 11 weeks, Easton released him on condition Whitburn would petition the king for his pardon. This was eventually given and is documented in British records. However, as we will find later, there may have been some issue. In the meantime, Easton decided to move his headquarters to Ferryland, and, uh, which faces the open Atlantic on the southern shore of the Avalon Peninsula. The pirate fortified the small harbor and continued to terrorize the shipping lanes until 1614. Easton left Newfoundland, presumably presumably with his vast store of loot, and set off with his ships for the Azores to capture another Spanish treasure fleet. His success there led to alliances on the eastern side of the Atlantic, which enabled Easton to amass an even greater fortune. He eventually retired from pro pu excuse me. He eventually retired from piracy as one of the world's wealthiest men, settling in Italy and purchasing a peerage as the Marquis of Savoy. Now, I will point out, again, some of the sources I have found say that he, in fact, settled in France, not Italy. Uh, but this is Eastern's, Easton's Fort is believed to have been just east of the present-day museum in Harbor Grace. Uh, we will examine some of the uh, exhibit from Harbor Grace, which deals with uh, Peter Easton in a little while as well. Today in Harbor Grace, the quaint old customs house is built on what is believed to be the site of Peter Easton's fort, which was later occupied by Henry Mainwaring, again, another fellow who turned pirate. The building houses a museum, which devotes an entire room to the legendary pirate admiral, and includes models of what his fort and one of his ships, the Happy Adventure, are believed to have looked like. Easton and his men also left other legacies in Newfoundland. His lieutenant, and I will use the British, or the English pronunciation there, his lieutenant Gilbert Pike and his wife Princess Sheila, again according to author Horwood, sired what became one of the oldest and largest families in Canada. Across the bay, in Kelligrews, named after the powerful family that originally sponsored Easton's piracy in south southwestern England, sorry, that would have been privateering, uh, some of his men remained and adopted their leader's surname when he left Newfoundland. Horwood claims their descendants can still be found in the area. And uh, Easton is, in fact, still a somewhat common name in parts of Newfoundland. Uh, Pike as well. Uh, moving on to the next article. Uh, and it does, in fact, give his name as Easton Peter, which is somewhat odd. But um, actually, before I move on to this particularly dry one, we'll take a quick look at this very short one from the Facebook page, The Pirate's Experience. Peter Easton was an English pirate that became known not only as one of the most notorious pirates from this country, but also as one of the most successful pirates of all time. In his early years, he had been a loyal servant of the English crown. The lives of many English privateers changed forever on the 23rd of June, 1604, when Elizabeth I was succeeded by James I, who immediately sued for peace between England and Spain. During his career as a pirate, Peter Easton was described not as a bloodthirsty monster, but as a highly capable naval officer who was well-versed in tactics, leadership, and trade. These abilities helped him to gather around him a formidable force able to attack more ambitious targets. During one campaign of piracy, he plundered more than 30 ships. He managed to retire from piracy with all the treasures he collected on the sea. Uh, given the stories about burning certain ships, I wouldn't necessarily believe that. To this day, it is not known how Peter Easton lived the remainder of his life and how or when he died. 
and we have a picture here that purports to be Peter Easton. And there are reenactments uh, or reimagined reimaginings, I suppose would be the best term, of uh, Peter Easton's exploits uh, performed in Harbor Grace every year. Or at least as far as I know, every year. Now we'll take a quick look at that very, very dry article here. Uh, once I skip to this one, there we are. So Peter Easton, once a loyal English seaman, later turned pirate, whose well-equipped fleet of warlike ships and intensive raids on both English and foreign ships earned him the appellation Arch Pirate, uh, flourished from 1610 to about 1620. And again, he arrived in Newfoundland in about 1612 with ten sail of good ships, well-furnished and very rich, and proceeded with impunity to raid coastal harbors from Trinity Bay to Ferryland at his own good pleasure. I do love this old language. He made Harbor Grace his headquarters, where he repaired his ships, built a fort, and added men to his crews by persuasion, and if necessary, by force. In addition to his depredations in the waters adjacent to Harbor Grace, where he took two ships, a hundred men, and provisions from every ship, Easton plundered thirty English vessels in the harbor of St. John's and raided French and Portuguese ships at Ferryland. I will also point out uh, French, Portuguese, and probably Basque as well. Uh, the total damage inflicted by Easton on the fishing fleets was estimated at twenty thousand pounds four hundred. Uh, that would be roughly, if I have it correct, about four hundred times that amount nowadays. So roughly eight hundred thousand, or eight hundred to eight hundred and ten thousand pounds. Easton's peripatetic exploits brought him into personal contact with Richard Whitburn, afterwards Sir Richard a long-time legitimate trader, and John Guy, governor of the colony at Cooper's, now Cupid's Cove. It must be said in Easton's favor that he did no actual harm to the settlement. Indeed, on one occasion, the settlers gave him two pigs. There was only one clash with the colonists, in which one of them was wounded by error. Easton did, however, capture Whitburn, uh, a name that is also known in eastern Newfoundland, uh, whom he kept on board his ship for eleven weeks, attempting all the while to convert him to piracy. He only released Whitburn, again, as we heard earlier, on condition that the latter should go to England and seek a royal pardon. When Whitburn arrived in England, he found that a pardon had already been granted to the pirate. Again, some of the details are fuzzy. This is 510, 511 years ago. Records could be a little iffy. Uh, he found that a pardon had already been granted to the pirate, but that it had never reached him. It was re-granted on the 26th of November, Captain Roger Middleton was commissioned to deliver the pardon to Easton in Barbary, as the pirate had left Newfoundland to sail to the Mediterranean in search of Spanish treasure ships. According to Whitburn, Easton consumed, Easton consumed with a longing desire and full expectation to be called home, lost that hope by too much delaying of time by him who carried the pardon. Easton's pardon had still not reached him in March of 1613, whereupon he sailed into Villafranche, Savoy, free port of the pirates. Because of his reputed wealth, two million pounds of what they're calling gold, he was warmly welcomed by the Duke of Savoy, whose finances were then at a low ebb. At Villefranche, Easton bought a palace, set up a warehouse for his booty, lived in luxury, and acquired the title Marquis of Savoy. Being at that time a handsome man around forty, according to contemporary descriptions, he crowned his career by marrying a very wealthy lady. He remained in the service of the Duke of Savoy until 1620, when he is lost, as, lost to history. Easton was the leading corsair of his day, and one of the most famous in the whole annals of piracy. He possessed all the requisite skills for his infamous trade, but he was neither bloodthirsty nor a swashbuckling cutthroat. On the contrary, he proved himself an outstanding navigator, an able, brave, and bold seaman, an expert tactician, and highly competent in gun-laying. I will actually have to do a quick search for the term gun-laying, as I am not 100% certain of what that means. And gun laying is the process of aiming an artillery piece, which I suspected this was, or a turret, such as a gun, howitzer, or a mortar, on land, air, or sea, against surface or aerial, uh, I assume, targets. So, in other words, he was a good shot. Uh, with, uh, how do they term it? Artillery. There we go. 
He controlled such sea power that no sovereign or state could afford to ignore him, and he was never overtaken nor captured by any fleet commissioned to hunt him down. And we come over here now to a, a site known as Find a Grave, which is a little bit of a misnomer in the case of Captain Easton. Uh, this is a picture that purports to be Easton, though I don't necessarily know that it is. I will attempt to get that back to where it should be. And, as you can see, he's uh, somewhat reminiscent of the Captain Morgan uh, figure from the rum bottles. Though that's based on Henry Morgan. And we have some details here. His birth was 1570. Uh, this would not have been in Canada. That's clearly wrong, as Canada was not extant at the time. It wasn't even called Canada at the time. At least not to the best of my knowledge. It would have been probably New France or uh, possibly unnamed in general. Uh, and obviously he was not born in Canada, as we've seen two sources already that cited him as being English-born. Uh, his death is suspected to be around 1620, and he would have been aged around 49 to 50. And again, it's very difficult to uh, know exactly where this might be, as his burial details are considered unknown. Uh, now I'll move on to... Let me see here. Well, we, we have, of course, the slightly requisite Wikipedia article. Uh, and, again, here is where we come to the first mention of him having been Scottish. So, in this case, I think Wikipedia may very well have it wrong, as this is uh, requesting citation for verifications. Uh, I think it's kind of ironic that there are also two other Peter Eastons, one of whom is an American accounting researcher, and the other an Australian cricketer. <laughs> uh, but we'll read this rather quickly. Uh, Peter Easton, born around 1570, uh, or sorry, uh, his life having ex extended around 1570 to around 1620, possibly after, was a Scottish privateer and later pirate in the early 17th century. Conflicting accounts exist regarding his early life, as we've seen. By 1602, Easton had become a highly successful privateer commissioned to protect English interests in Newfoundland. The most famous English pirate of the day... His piracies ranged from Ireland and Guinea to Newfoundland. Uh, Guinea, if I recall correctly, is the country in South America. Uh, it may be a Caribbean country in South America, if I have my geography correct. He is best known today for his involvement in the early English settlement of Newfoundland, including the settlements at Harbor Grace and Fairyland from 1611 to 1614. One of the most successful of all pirates, he controlled such sea power that no sovereign or state could afford to ignore him, and he was never overtaken or captured by any fleet, as we mentioned earlier. However, he is not as well known as some of the pirates from the late 17th and early 18th centuries, which, if I recall correctly, is known as the Golden Age of Piracy. Uh, supposedly born in Scotland, supposedly died in Savoy. Uh, most likely died in Savoy, as the, the records seem to be a little more solid at that era, at that end, rather. Uh, during his piratical career, his allegiance was the Kingdom of England and the Duchy of Savoy. I think we could dispute both of these on the basis that during this time, he was a privateer, not a pirate. It's really a matter of semantics, depending on who's offering the opinion. And when he was part of the Duchy of Savoy, he had already retired. Uh, his bases of operation include Newfoundland and the Caribbean, and as we've heard, the, uh, the Mediterranean as well. Um, I will be leaving the uh, the Wikipedia article at this point, uh, except with the possible exception of yes, we we will. I was simply looking for uh, uh, an image that might have been available. Images of uh, of Peter Easton are few and far between. I think. Speaking of images, we'll come to those as well. Now we did mention the Conception Bay Museum, the Museum of Harbor Grace earlier. And this is an article written in 2017 called No Colony for Old Men, which, of course, is a takeoff on the movie of No Country for Old Men. Peter Easton in Conception Bay. Regarding the early history of Conception Bay, few stories get as much traction as that of Peter Easton, the privateer-turned-pirate whose power in the area knew no bounds. 
However, the story is fraught with discrepancies, and local folklore often plugs any gaps in the official history. Most of what we know comes from primary sources, namely letters and early writings, and even these are sometimes contradictory. For instance, one source says Easton was a man of low birth, another that he was late of London and a gentleman. Pedigree is but one example of mystery clouding history, and as we've seen, he's also been cited as Scottish. Uh, but through the cannon smoke, a narrative has emerged, a tale of murder, kidnappings, battle, and of course, treasure. And this is a, uh, a picture of a Dutch uh, merchantman, I guess. Uh, I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation of Bruegel the Elder, which is cited as a 16th century ship. Uh, when he was good. According to sources, Easton's time in Newfoundland began around 1602 when Queen Elizabeth I sent a uh, British Royal Navy fleet to the island to protect the migratory fishery from attack. At the time, the Anglo-Spanish War had been raging for 17 years, and English fishing, English fishing vessels were fair play for the Spanish, who had also made inroads into the New World, along with the French, Basque, and Portuguese. As an admiral in the Navy and a certified privateer, Easton had carte blanche to raid and steal from any rivals of the English. A profitable venture for a seafarer in 17th century Newfoundland, where neither law nor organized religion uh, presided. During this er early period of the Eastern story, one usually encounters the legend of Princess Sheila Nagara and Lieutenant Gilbert Pike. Uh, of course, this kind of falls into... Uh, talking about Sheila and Gilbert themselves, the town of Carboneer is mentioned. Back to the Anglo-Spanish War for a second. After Elizabeth I passed in March 1603, James I ascended. One of his first orders of business was ending the war and significantly reducing the size of the Royal Navy. For someone accustomed to unbridled power and wealth, Easton found it difficult to stop attacking rival ships, so he continued. But without a leg to stand on legally, Easton crossed the opaque line between privateer and pirate, and a warrant was soon issued for his arrest. However, obviously, catching someone so mobile proved difficult. From 1602 to 1610, Easton traveled to various locations across the greater Atlantic Ocean. According to the record, historian Richard Whitburn, huh, another Whitburn, writes in his book, Crosses and Comforts Being the Life and Times of Sir Richard Whitburn, that, quote, Easton is first heard of somewhere off the coast of Ireland in 1608. When a fellow pirate staggered into Cork Harbor complaining of Easton, quote, treacherously overthrowing him. Soon after, in 1610, reports say that Eastern, Easton killed Sockowell, or Sal killed a supposedly petty rebel and pirate, throwing him overboard from his own ship. Outside of the Emerald Isle, Easton often rendezvoused at the port of Memora on Africa's Barbary coast, today the Maghreb, where as many as 40 pirate ships manned by 2,000 Englishmen unloaded stolen cargo to local merchants. Easton also spent extended... Oh, spent. Easton also spent extended periods of time in Guinea, the West Indies, and the Azores. And these maps are of the Barbary Coast, if I recall correctly. Yes, these are 17th century maps by the Dutch cartographer Jan Genis, Jansonius, showing the Barbary Coast, uh, North Africa was a popular hunt for Easton and other rogues, because the slave trade was so very lucrative. In 1610, Easton blocked off the Bristol Channel, forcing the ships entering and leaving the area to pay him hefty protection fees. During this time, the wealthy Killigrew, also known as Killigrew's, family of Falmouth Cornwall, were financing his activities. Oh, I do apologize. Earlier I was under the assumption they had been sponsoring his privateering, not his piracy. And as they were financing his activities, this gave Easton a significant degree of latitude in a country where he was wanted. Unsurprisingly, the Bristol merchants didn't take kindly to this taxation racket and appealed to the Lord High Admiral Charles Howard, 1st Earl of Nottingham, who sent the privateer Henry Mainwaring after Easton. Mainwaring never had any luck capturing Easton and ended up turning to piracy himself in 1614. I also sense a trend here. Uh, just to return to the Terra Nova side of Terra Nova Tuesday, the Newfoundland leg of our story continues around 1611 to 1612, depending on what you read, when Easton fortified the Bears Cove area of Harbor Grace. The extent of the fortifications are open to debate. Some say there was a fort, others a few cannon. 
Either way, the pirate did frequent Harbor Grace and docked his ship, the Happy Adventure, at Capelin Cove. Easton also fortified Kelly's Island, again, this is somewhat apocryphal, near Bell Island and Odoran Island in Placentia Bay, again, not something that's been mentioned elsewhere, and supposedly spent significant time in Renews and Fairyland, where he built a house. Uh, YouTuber Newfoundland Metal Detecting recently visited Kelly's Island. His vlog of the state gives a good impression of the rugged landscape. Unfortunately, his video is not available. Uh, in 1612, while Easton was away on a Caribbean voyage, the French bass captured the fort at Harbor Grace. As Easton's ship... Let me just pause this. Uh, and, of course, this is where some of my images have come from. Uh, the two rivals... Oh, sorry. Uh, in 1612, while Easton was away on a Caribbean voyage, the French Basques captured the fort at Harbor Grace. As Easton's ships returned to the harbor, the Basque fleet sailed out to meet him. Again, we, we find that some details are muddled. The two rivals clashed off Harbor Grace Island, and the Basque's lead ship, the St. Malo, ran aground on Eastern Rock. Forty-seven of Easton's men died in the battle, and there is reasonable cause to believe they were buried in the Bears Cove area. Several years ago, the Coglin United Church, this picture below, dug a new sewer line and discovered something unexpected, a mass grave. The clothing and dating of the bodies are consistent with the period, and the location makes sense as well, since Easton's fortifications were just across the present-day street. Of course, Easton wasn't the only person in Newfoundland at the time. Acting on the authority of merchants and the English crown, early colonists had established headquarters at various locations on the island. Established in 1610, John Guy's Cooper's Cove settlement, now known as Cupid's, was the first in Newfoundland, and the second oldest in North America after Jamestown, Virginia. The site of Guy's colony is currently an archaeological dig and definitely worth checking out. Uh, we will move along. In a letter dated July of 1612, Guy writes of an encounter with the Arch Pirate. Because the proceedings of one Captain Peter Easton, a pirate and his company since, are most fit to be known, before I touch our plantation business, you shall understand what they have been unto this time. Until the 17th of this present, the said Captain Easton remained in Harbor Grace, there trimming and repairing his ship, and commanding not only the carpenters of each ship to do his business, but hath taken victuals, munition, and necessaries from every ship, together with about 100 men out of the bay, to man his ships, being now in number six. He purposed to have before he goeth, as is said, out of the land five hundred men. As I sailed from hence towards Renews in a small bark, I fell into one of their hands, and one of my company was hurt with a musket. There was one of their crew that wintered with me here the first year, by whose means, and because I was in the bark, they made show that they were sorry that they had meddled with us, and so they departed from us without coming aboard. That which they sought after was men to increase their number. And I will point out, this is actually extremely unusual behavior in the annals of piracy, as this shows a degree of honor and potentially national loyalty that is generally not present in the later supposed golden age of piracy. Before the said Captain Easton's departure, he sent three ships into Trinity Bay to store himself with victuals, munition, and men, and who are said to be worse used than the ships here. He taketh much ordnance from them. The said Easton was lately at St. John's, and is now, as far as I can learn, at Fairyland, where he taketh his pleasure, and thereabouts the rest are to meet him. It is given out that he will send one Captain Harvey in a ship to Ireland, to understand news about his pardon, which, if he can obtain in that large and ample manner as he expecteth, then he giveth out that he will come in. In other words, he has made it known that he will surrender himself if a pardon is forthcoming. Otherwise, it is thought that he will get protection of the Duke of Florence, and that, in his course here hence, he will hover about westwards of the islands of the Azores, to see whether he can light upon any of the plate fleet or any good rich booty before his coming in. Albeit he hath so prevailed here to the strengthening of himself, and encouraging of others to attempt the like hereafter, yet were there that course taken, as I hope shall be, it is a most easy matter to repress them. Uh, it's kind of interesting that... Uh, right here. Uh, John Guy is suggesting he hopes people take up the pirate sword so that he can put them down as he expects it to be easy. And though Guy enjoyed relatively cordial relations with Easton, colonist Sir Richard Whitburn was not so fortunate, and we've talked about Sir Richard Whitburn earlier. When in Fairyland in 1612, Easton kidnapped Whitburn and six other masters of English vessels. In captivity, Whitburn rejected Easton's golden promises of much wealth to put in his hands, but agreed to seek the pirate a pardon from James I. 
After 11 weeks of detainment, Whitburn then headed for England, where he found a pardon had already been granted from Ireland, dated February 1612. Another pardon was later issued on November 26, 1612. However, neither reached Easton, whose, quote, hovering with those ships and riches upon the coast of Barbary with a longing desire and full expectation to be called home, lost that hope, as we've said earlier, by too much delaying of time of him who carried the pardon. And uh, we have some numbers for once. With eight ships and 500 men in tow, Easton left Newfoundland and headed for the Azores, hunting the Spanish Plate Fleet, also known as the Silver Fleet. There, he's succeeding in capturing three of these treasure ships, succeeded, sorry, which bega became known, uh, or was, rather, the largest successful pirate heist until that time. Easton retwi retired, Easton retired sometime between 1614 and 15 in Villefranche, France, on the Riviera. Again, as we've seen earlier, some places have cited Italy. Uh, with his finances in the mire, the Duke of Savoy, Carlos Emmanuel I, made his ports free in hopes that trade could be boosted through Nice and Villefranche. And for the pirates of Mamora, the offer of free asylum and safe conduct for criminals was enticing. Striking up a kinship with the Duke, Easton agreed to pay one-time tithe on his wealth in exchange for protection. Uh, as you will see when we come to the purported amount of that wealth, um, the Duke of Savoy would have been a damn fool to turn Easton down or to try to get more out of him uh, in exchange for protection. His pens penchant for violence didn't completely stop, though. When visiting Turin, the local Duke employed Easton in his attack on the Duke of Mantua, a neighbor and rival. In this brief conflict, Easton supposedly covered himself with glory. Among his other achievements, he was so skillful in laying guns that a few shots by him produced more effect than most gunners produce from many. In other words, he was a good shot and could pick targets well. But at Villefranche, Easton finally had a truly safe haven to land his ships and wealth, which, with which he bought a title, the Marquis of Savoy. He soon married a rich heiress and retired in splendor. Any references to Easton stop in 1620, when scholars suspect he died in France. And uh, if we go further, there is reference to a W5 documentary, The Pirates of Newfoundland, and uh, a few other notable projects regarding Easton. But, to move along, we'll have a look at some images that I managed to find. Uh, here we have an image of a plaque from Harbor Grace. This is on the Harbor Grace Museum, as far as I can tell. Uh, so this is Peter Easton, the Pirate Admiral, fortified this site in 1610 and made Newfoundland his base until 1614. He defeated a French squadron at Harbor Grace in 1611, recruited 5,000 fishermen from this colony into his crews, and raided foreign shipping as far as the Caribbean and the Mediterranean. But we'll leave that alone. Uh, in 1614, he intercepted the Spanish plate fleet at the Azores, captured three, thousand, uh, three treasure ships, sorry, and divided an immense fortune among his crews. He was twice pardoned and invited home by James I, but retired instead to southern France, where he became Marquis of Savoy and lived in great splendor. And uh, the first curator of the Conception Bay Museum is memorialized on this plaque as well. Um, and... Inside the museum, we find quite an interesting room, which has uh, a lot of uh, Eastern exhibits. So the first one, of course, is this one, which is a mannequin depicting Peter Easton, possibly as he looked at the time. Uh, over here, we have a model of the Happy Adventure, or at least a purported model of it. Uh, and as you can see in the background of this picture, there are a few plaques around. One of them, or among them, is a plaque that reads... Oh, my apologies, that's a little bigger than I meant it to be. We'll just see about bringing that up a little touch. There we go. Peter Easton establishes his headquarters at Harbor Grace. And that would have been 1610. And, of course, here we have Newfoundland now. This is a little bit incorrect, as Easton would have been in this area of Newfoundland. Uh, more specifically, if I recall correctly, Conception Bay right here. 
uh, but it does show the extent of his travels, which is quite impressive for the time period that he was in. Uh, but the Age of Sail was something of a, I suppose we could call it a, uh, an era of wonders in some ways. Uh, there's further plaques for Peter Easton. I'm just setting up the next plaque here, and we'll take a quick look at this one. And let me just blow that up a touch. In 1610, Peter Easton, the world's most powerful pirate, controlled all commerce through the Bristol Channel. He forced the Bristol merchants to pay protection fees while taking from them seamen, supplies, and cargo as security for safe passage in and out of the ports. The Bristol merchants sent a petition to Lord Nottingham, uh, I believe the word here is begging, relief from Easton's actions. Lord Nottingham commissioned Henry Mainwaring to locate Easton and bring him back to England. Easton, hearing of this, uh, prepared ten ships and sailed the high seas to Newfoundland. And, of course, it continues in French for some reason. I'm sure the French were no fans of Peter Easton either. Uh, but moving on to... There we are. Okay. Uh, moving on to another plaque in the Harbor Grace Museum. This tells the story of the French, uh, the Basque capturing Easton's fort. Uh, the Basque captured Easton's fort while he was on a Caribbean voyage. On his return, the fleet sailed out to give battle. The lead ship, Saint Malo, was beached on Eastern Rock, and the rest were either sunk or captured, and 47 of Easton's pirates were killed and buried at Bear's Cove nearby. Easton recaptured his fort. Uh, if I can get this to work well, I will bring this image up so that we might read the caption below it. Uh, Easton and the Basques engaged in battle. This is actually quite a simple but very pretty picture. Okay, and the last plaque, I believe is the last plaque in any case, uh, that we're going to look at deals with Easton's pardons. Sorry, there is one more after that, which deals with his retirement. But we'll have a look at this one first. In February 1612, a pardon was granted to the pirate Admiral Peter Easton by King James I. On November 26th, another pardon was granted by James I. It is not known for certain whether or not Easton actually received the pardons. And we've uh, had ample evidence that it may not have actually happened at all. And for the final plaque, I believe, just let me check my links really quickly. Yes. Okay. Uh, we will have a look at Easton's retirement. In 1615, Peter Easton paid off his men, sold his ships, and moved to France. There he purchased the title Marquis of Savoy from the Duke of Savoy. He retired with a personal fortune estimated at two million pounds sterling. Now, at that time, oh goodness, I seem to have, yes, okay, uh, so I'll do this a little bit live, because this particular link did not uh, persist. So, two million, oh, I don't know that I got that right, let me make sure, one, two, three, four, five, six, two million pounds in 1615 would have been worth. Uh, we'll say, since he was, well, we'll, we'll leave it with today's date, but, uh, so we're talking about two million pounds sterling in 1615, which today would have been worth 425 million pounds. As I said earlier, the Duke of Savoy would have been a damn fool if he was having financial problems and didn't offer Easton a shot at, you know, something like freedom. Uh, and I believe we're coming to the end of my links here. Yes. So we've looked at what his uh, approximate wealth would have been. Now we'll have a look at the area of Villefranche, if I can get a good look at that. Um, yes, okay. 
So this is an image from uh, Leading Estates of the World. This is, I do not purport that this is Easton's, excuse me, estate at all, but I'm just giving an example of the area that Easton would have, um, I suppose, uh, settled in. And it's a beautiful area. Uh, it's in the south of France, I believe near Nice, on the, the French Riviera. And as you can see from some of these images, it's just a beautiful place. And there were mentions that uh, Easton's estate did overlook the harbor. So, possibly. Obviously, he wouldn't have had a pool, but it's a, a, certainly a comfortable uh, way to wrap up one's life. And of course, Peter Easton's legacy does continue here in Newfoundland. Uh, there is a place in St. John's known as the Peter Easton Pub, where in fact I myself have um, had at least one wild Friday night that I recall, and possibly another that I didn't. Uh, just to place it in context, this is uh, in the one of the oldest parts of St. John's. Uh, if for you ever have an opportunity to visit St. John's, I highly recommend visiting the rooms as well, uh, the Museum on the Hill. It's pretty much unmissable. But this is the Peter Easton Pub. Uh, this is an image from outside, or sorry, from inside. Uh, I do have some images of the inside as well, as it turns out that... Uh, well, here is the exterior. Oh, I didn't quite switch that link. There we go. Uh, this is the exterior of the pub with a uh, fairly simple sign. It's it's actually quite easy to miss that pub if you're not looking for it. Uh, there are a variety of places like that in Newfoundland, or in St. John's especially. Uh, the interior of the pub is quite nicely decorated. This is from some event that was put off by Munn uh, based on the clothing and hairstyles and the quality of the picture. I'm going to guess this was sometime in the 90s, possibly 80s. Um, moving along, I believe I have one more link to share, and that is, in fact, the Peter Easton Pub's Facebook page. And as you can see, they have live music and it's probably a, a fun place to hang out. And the address is, for those of you interested, uh, 26 Cookstown Road in St. John's. And their phone number is also listed. And their email address. And they're open right now. <laughs> so, uh, this has been quite the, uh, the exhaustive little look into Peter Easton. Uh, I will be eventually looking into the legend of Sheila Nagira as well. Uh, and as I said, that is much more couched in uh, legend rather than actual fact. At least with uh, Peter Easton, there is, while there is, as, I, as we all noticed, a degree of mm, sketchy detail at times and disagreement amongst sources, uh, it is... One of those things about Newfoundland that really makes it wonderful to actually be from here and really kind of drives home how much history this island actually has. So, again, thank you for being here. Uh, please do check out the Subscribe Star, uh, the merch store. If you want to send me PayPal, use my email address, uh, ardenparty at gmail.com. Similarly, if you're in Canada and don't wish to pay the PayPal fees, you can actually send me a direct interact transfer through my bank account at ardenparty at gmail.com. However, please do let me know what your security question answer will be. Uh, if you want to send me, if, if you have an idea for another topic for Terra Nova Tuesday, use that same email address and just put something in the subject line to let me know what you're telling me. Uh, other than that, I believe I am done. In which case, there's nothing left to say except, I hope you're having a good day, I hope you continue to have good days, and as always, rise and rise again until lambs become lions.
Bye-bye. Yes, I would like to.